Uh, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for coming to uh, to my talk. Um, so yeah, my talk will be a short one, um, but we have a little bit of a bigger slot here. So the benefit of that will be I will talk uh, a bit less quickly than I, than I normally do. Um, but my short talk for you today uh, will be on navigating the open source uh, security fog. So uh, the weather outside is uh, pretty typical today, um, and, and in here things are also going to get a bit hazy, well, figuratively at least, hopefully not literally, um, as we dive into a case study of murky vulnerability data. So quick about me, I have very short and sweet uh, about me. Um, I'm a vulnerability analyst with the Synopsys Cybersecurity Research Center, part based here in Belfast, um, where we specialize in reporting and research into vulnerabilities in open source software. And this is where I started my career uh, five years ago. So five years experience, uh, a fair bit less than some of the excellent speakers uh, we've had here today, uh, but did hit one nice wee milestone uh, this year, which was uh, discovering and publishing uh, my first uh, CVE uh, uh, records uh, at the start of the year, uh, which, I don't know, I guess that sort of puts me in and around sort of the small baby, small, small wind baby phase of my career. So, um, And one of those CVEs is going to be the basis uh, for this talk. Um, so I'm going to run through uh, one of those CVEs called Remote Code Execution in OpenTSDB via the legacy query API. We'll get to what all that means um, shortly. Um, that's a link to um, the advisory that we published on our synopsis blog for this issue. Um, and the talk will be split in broadly two parts. Uh, uh, in the first half, we'll look at the vulnerability itself. Um, there's nothing particularly groundbreaking about the exploitation of this vulnerability, but it is it's a nice wee example of how um, a seemingly innocent looking web interface that this component has uh, can lead to nasty things. And then in the second half, hopefully um, the part that will be a bit more interesting um, and uh, uh, we'll have sort of uh, useful takeaways from it, um, we'll actually look at the history behind this vulnerability. Um, and this vulnerability did have a pretty messy history uh, behind the disclosure of it. So hopefully there'll be a few things that all of us, from users to developers and researchers of open source, so open source software, uh, can learn from it. Before I go into any of the details of vulnerability, um, I'm actually going to start with the single biggest lesson uh, I can teach first, which is everything I'm about to say is much, much easier said than done. So I'm going to be talking about this vulnerability and sort of the mistakes, the oversights, and miscommunications um, that were made with the handling of this vulnerability. Um, that will absolutely not be to cast judgment on anyone that was involved uh, with the handling of this vulnerability, uh, because uh, these things are difficult. Security is very, very difficult, and it's really only with the benefit of hindsight that um, I'm coming in and time that I'm coming here and saying, hey, here's some pitfalls uh, that we can be aware of when handling open source security. So what is OpenTSDB? Open uh, somewhat predictably, it's an open source TSDB solution. Um, so it's a source code available component. Um, and TSDB uh, means time series database. Uh, so basically data that you're collecting continuously over time and probably which you'll have very large amounts of. So think things like processor loads, stock prices, weather data, things like that. Um, and the maintainer really can explain better um, than I can what exactly OpenTSDB does. Um, in their own words, um, it's a management application that lets you store, index, and serve metrics at a large scale um, and make this data easily accessible and graphable. And the graphable part is going to be the key um, to the vulnerability I find being able to exploit it. So that's OpenTSDB. Um, the vulnerability is in the legacy query API. So what is that? Um, this is an endpoint called Q endpoint, uh, one of the endpoints that this component has. And basically what it allows for is for a user to ask OpenTSDB, um, I want data for um, a particular metric I'm tracking um, with various uh, query filters that you can apply to it. Um, and the component will return graphable plot data for that query. Um, and the plot part is done by a library called uh, GNU plot. Um, so how does the data get to this library? Um, well, basically, the function in this endpoint is, or this query API is, um, the user say, is saying, here's the D my DB query, here's the data I want to get uh, for the particular metric I'm tracking my database. Definitely not malicious at all. Um, and eventually, this data is going to be passed to GNU plot, um, which uh, uh, creates the plot that then a plot of the data is returned back to the user. Um, so, how exactly does GNU plot get that data? Well, in between these two, um, 
what OpenTSDB does, it says, okay, I'll validate that data, and then I'll pass it on to GNUplot. And the exact way it passes on that data um, is it inserts the query parameters that the user provided directly into a shell script. Um, so the example sort of endpoint query I've got up there um, with those um, query parameters in yellow, um, when that's sent to OpenDSDB, it'll create something something like this, um, a shell script um, with those parameters after validation directly um, inserted in, um, um, and then that'll be run. Uh, uh, that'll be run with uh, those GNU plot commands, and the plot will be created. So I'm sure it'll be obvious to to many of you that the red flag here here is you know in the middle bit that it's very very important that this validation works correctly because if it doesn't then you've got untrusted input going into commands that are directly executed by the system um, and unfortunately uh, validation for this endpoint um, wasn't foolproof so a carefully crafted payload can bypass it break out of those plot commands in the shell script uh, and basically run any system command you want uh, within the privileges of the running OpenTest DB service. So I'll show what that actually looks like, the exploitation of it um, in video form. This is the most delicate part of the presentation because I've discovered that this video can crash PowerPoint if I'm not careful. So um, that's just how serious this vulnerability is, that um, a video of it can cause PowerPoint panic. Um, so if we're very, very careful here, I can play this um, and this is the front end open TSDB. Um, so um, you can insert, you know, your query parameters, you know, what, what you're looking for for your metrics, and you get plotted graph data. Um, and that's that's running through one API through the front end. So the particular API we're interested in, we can run queries on that di directly. And um, the parameter I'm going to exploit in this particular um, video is the smooth parameter. Um, that malicious parameter, that's not actually the exploit code. Um, obviously, it'd be nice if it was, um, but uh, the specific details of how that works will we'll keep under wraps because that wasn't um, publicly disclo disclosed as part of um, as part of our disclosure. Um, but yes, when you run this command normally, you will get a JSON response saying, yep, that data was plotted, all good. Um, but when you run it with the malicious malicious payload I have, which is able to sort of break the control flow of that shell script, um, and then a carefully craft, craft, carefully formatted system command will let you run any system command you want. So you know that is really it's really quite serious if you have access, you know, to this open TSDB endpoint and you, you're allowed to supply uh, queries to it. You know, there's lots of really bad things you can do. You can exfiltrate sensitive data from the server that you're targeting. Um, you could set up a reverse shell so that you could have an ongoing connection to the system. Or perhaps most seriously of all, when I run it, um, you could run uh, the system's calculator app, um, as every good uh, command execution POC should show off. So we can't, can't, be having, can't be having rogue calculations going on on your servers. Very serious. So is that where this story ends? Um, it is, actually. That's the end. Um, but it's not the start. It's not the start of the story. Um, this vulnerability had a very long history, very unique history of disclosure, um, and this is where this is where the fog is going to roll in, and um, the the very high resolution fog um, couldn't afford couldn't afford a real life smoke machine. Sorry, but um, but yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and navigate backwards in time through the history of vulnerability to illustrate what specifically happened with the evolution of this issue and sort of the pitfalls that everyone involved sort of tripped over. Um, so this is going to get confusing. Um, don't worry if it confuses the, uh, the B-sides out of you. Um, in fact, accept and embrace the confusion because that's kind of the point of, of why we'll go through this. Uh, and through that, there should be some interesting things to learn. So I'll start off with... Um, the most recent bit, what I disclosed, um, and first admission to make is, uh, so I presented that vulnerability as, you know, something that was brand new, discovered in a vacuum. It wasn't. Uh, what I actually find was a bypass to an, an earlier fix intended uh, intended to address the issue. Um, what was that earlier fix that was able to be by bypassed? Well, essentially, I won't go too much into detail in this, but essentially some regular expression validation was added to these query parameters, which was intended to lock down what input you could supply to those query parameters. So intended to be, you can only um, supply those options, nothing else, no bad characters, no bad commands or anything. Um, but when, we, ins when uh, we inspected this fix commit and see what exactly was done, we realized that 
whilst this is what that was meant to say, um, what the, the, the way the regex was defined specifically, what it actually meant was uh, you could stick in one of those four options in front of your malicious code and it'll pass validation. And um, so unfortunately it, it didn't work because um, it just hadn't been quite, the regex hadn't been quite um, defined correctly. So that was able to be bypassed. So obviously, um, because you know I discovered an incomplete fix to this issue, there must have been a previous disclosure uh, of this specific vulnerability um, prior to mine. Of course there was, so let's try and go find it. Let's go uh, wandering through the fog again, backwards in time, and let's see um, what we can find. And what we do find is back in November 2020 uh, was, was uh, a previous report um, which led to that fix, which then I identified as it could be bypassed. Um, but this report also was for an incomplete fix, um, um, which was very much, and I won't bog down too much with the details of, of all these uh, various disclosures and fixes, uh, but basically this, this, uh, this disclosure was much like mine. Um, they find a way, um, a different way, they were able to bypass the parameter validation, um, and so it required um, further fixing, which unfortunately uh, didn't, quite, didn't quite work. So of course, just like my report, that also implies that there was a disclosure prior to this, so let's look through the fog some more. And what do we turn up? Well, we've got a report here from uh, June 2018. Um, and what did this one say? Well, it said that they find and exploited this vulnerability, this particular researcher. Um, but at the time, they said, we think this is fixed. We've confirmed that this is fixed. Um, and that makes sense, right? At the time, they believed this was fixed. And it was only a couple of years later in 2020, another researcher said, oh, no, it actually could be bypassed. Needs a better fix applied. Um, so that all, that all makes sense, um, but hang on, what's going on now? There's more fog. Are, are we going back further in time? Well, we are. The fog clears again, and we've landed in June 2017 now. Um, and wait a minute, it's a report saying that it wasn't fixed. Um, it, it was known that this issue wasn't fixed. It was still exploitable um, a year before someone wrongly confirmed uh, that it was that's not good, obviously. Uh, imagine, you know, if you were involved in researching this vulnerability or handling this vulnerability in, in some way, um, and you'd only seen that 2018 report, you would have got a misleading picture um, at the time of sort of the state of this vulnerability. You thinking it's fixed, fixed, whilst everybody else, malicious actors, are like, nope, we can still exploit it. Um, I like this. Um, yep, yeah, and I, I also like this particular issue report, report as well because just in the middle of it, these are all public GitHub issues, by the way. Just in the middle of it, someone just comments, "Arg, why is security so hard?" Sad face, which um, I'm sure every single one of us can sympathise with. Um, so maybe we should spend a bit of time to reflect. On, oh no, wait, never mind. There's more fog. Uh, we've got to go backwards for further. There's still more to this issue. Um, what are we going to find now? Goodness knows. Wait, what is it? Oh right, March 2017, uh, an earlier disclosure in the same year um, that led to that fix that was known bad, um, but later misreported as good in 2018 before confirmed in 2020 before then being bypassed. All that stuff. Um, so that's clear now, right? That, that, that should be sort of the end of, nope, 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 we're still not done with this. Uh, the data here is still so foggy. Uh, what we get next? Well, we're in 2016 now, um, and an even earlier report. Um, and there is something particularly interesting about this disclosure of this, of this particular issue, which was this report said, hey, you know, command execution, we can do this in this, in this, in this query API. Um, but in the middle, in the middle of the report, they kind of quite confidently stated that the reason this vulnerability exists is when you're making a, a malicious request to this API and you request the data back as PNG, so, you know, just an, an image of the plot data um, that it's calculating. Um, if you cause an error, then it's in the, all the error handling. That's where the command injection happens, and that's where the, where the bad stuff is happening. Um, and unfortunately, the maintainer at the time really just took this at face value, uh, uh, and so the fix they applied was... Okie doke, we'll just chop off that uh, send as PNG command that was part of all that uh, job done. But unfortunately, that was, you know, as we've seen with the later disclosures, that wasn't the root cause of the issue. Um, you could, and the, indeed, the exploit that I was running was just sending the request, but returning it as JSON, completely bypassing any, you know, PNG output. So, so that wasn't related to it. But unfortunately, that was sort of taken and rolled with. And so that meant it, it wasn't fixed at the time. 
is that the end? Surely this must be the end. Nope, nope, it isn't. Um, but it nearly is. I promise it nearly is now. Uh, <laughs> you know, what could possibly be left? Well, thankfully, the, the, the earliest report that we were able to discover for this issue um, was back in April 2016. So really quite close to that May report by another researcher. Who basically, they basically discovered it independent of each other. Um, and it does stop there. So this is the full timeline of one vulnerability, how it went through a series of disclosures and a series of fixes. And, you know, I did say that, you know, all of this so very, very confusing and maybe being a bit flippant, like maybe when you go forward for it, it's actually quite simple. Um, yeah, it really is simple, isn't it? You know, two reports in 2016, you know, which, which independent of each other, which flagged the issue. One of them reporting, you know, uh, confirming the wrong root cause, which led to a bad fix, which then a year later uh, was reported, uh, but that, uh, that led to another bad fix. So later, later on in that year, someone said, nope, it's still not fixed, but it kind of fell by the wayside. So then in 2018, someone said, well, actually, I think it is fixed, even though it isn't. Um, and then two years later, someone else said, no, it isn't fixed. You've got to fix it. Uh, and then three years later, we came along um, and said, nope, still not fixed. Could you please fix it? Um, we disclosed that, um, and, and they tried to fix it, and we, and we validated it, and we think it's fixed. Um, and then we published it. So clear as mud, right? <laughs> Clear as day. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's everything. I just went through in one slide. Um, that is pretty much exactly how my brain felt when researching the vulnerability. Probably how some of your brains feel now too. Um, <laughs> there is a point to all that. Um, what I really have to stress is, you know, I, I've kind of raced through that history, you know, in a few minutes, you know, saying, oh, so confusing, all the fog. Um, but when I was first researching this vulnerability, it took far, far longer uh, uh, to actually work all that out. Uh, it took a lot more time than just sort of racing through the fog in a few minutes. So imagine if you were someone that was tasked with working out what happened with a single vulnerability, whether, you know, you were involved with, you know, trying to address the issue, whether you use OpenTSDB and, you know, in, 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 in your software and you're like, we need to address this, you know, you're going to have a bad time figuring this out. And this is just one single vulnerability. So imagine if you have loads of vulnerabilities in your open source software that you use. Um, you know, this is, this is, you don't want to have to be sort of trudging through all this, all this fog and all this sort of very messy data. So kind of just to summarize uh, what exactly what all that sort of uh, borderline conspiracy theory st uh, timeline was, um, we had seven separate disclosures for the one vulnerability. So, for all of that, I was talking about just the single vulnerability, command injection um, in that endpoint. Um, and particularly, should note particularly that six of those disclosures were sort of fully, fully public GitHub issues. So they were just posted up. Anyone could see them, you know, even before, even before the maintainer had, you know, seen it and realized the issue and tried to fix it. That was all sort of fully publicly available at the time. Um, through those seven disclosures, four patches were attempted. Three of them, unfortunately, uh, didn't work. Hopefully, the last one um, is all good now. Three CDEs were re requested along that timeline. Um, so that's another important note. Not every disclosure of the issue actually got CDE disclosed for it. So some of them, some of them had CDE records. Other disclosures just didn't. They were just you would only know about them if you'd seen the GitHub issues. And all of this took place um, over seven years, which is certainly a long time for, you know, a fairly high severity vulnerability to sort of be out there um, in the public domain. So what meaning can we take from all that? Well, what's good about all this confusion is in one single example, it kind of nicely encapsulates encapsulate a lot of the things um, that the work that we do with Synopsis Circ, uh, that we end up coming across when researching and reporting vulnerabilities, sort of the thing, all the things that are hard um, about software security research and, and management. Um, we don't usually find them all in one single vulnerability, but in this one we did. So it ends up being quite a nice example of, of the things that are difficult and the things that could go wrong. Things like verifying vulnerability is, is fully fixed. Um, obviously, with some of those disclosures, um, we believe, you know, that, that it likely it wasn't done or it wasn't fully done in some cases with with how these issues were disclosed. A clear communication between researchers and maintainers. Um, as I said, you know, a lot of these were just public GitHub issues um, and you know, not all the information lined up. Uh, not a lot of it was clear. Um, and perhaps one thing I should emphasize as well um, on this point is um, something that I think is very easy to forget is that, you know, if you're a security researcher and you're disclosing something, someone, something to a maintainer of a software component, um, it's likely that you, you probably know more than they do about sort of the, the nature of, of sort of the vulnerability um, and the security side of it. 
But the flip side is they probably know a lot more um, about the actual working and operation of the component. So there's like there's a bit of a mismatch in sort of the, the knowledge that the two sides share. Um, and that I think sometimes that can be easily lost and can e easily lead to sort of miscommunications, uh, which means issues don't get um, resolved properly. Cross-referencing all this data obviously is very difficult. And you know, the most obvious example of that was you know, the reporter who confirmed an issue was fixed when a year prior someone said no, it isn't. Um, obviously, if they'd seen that, they probably wouldn't have said, no, it's fine, if I get the latest version, it's grand, it's all fixed. Um, and identifying vulnerability scope and root cause causes, as with one of the earliest reports, sort of honing in on, we think this is a root cause, maintainer went along with that, but unfortunately that didn't, that didn't uh, address the issue. Um, and another thing, you know, which is it's not unique to open source, but maybe is exacerbated by open source, you know, available time resources to address issues. So obviously, you know, seven disclosures over seven years, large time gaps, you know, between these. And this is just the reality sometimes of open source software. The, um, the sort of popularity and the usage of open source, open source software isn't necessarily related to the amount of available time resources that people can be, can put into maintaining it. And then if there's security issues, making sure they're addressed in a timely fashion. So they don't always line up. Um, so sometimes, you know, a lot of time can pass before these things are, are addressed, just sitting in the public domain for any bad actor to, to realize that this can be done. Um, and then from a user side as well, it shows very well that, you know, when these things happen, you know, when the things that are hard about software security research and management, when, you know, these aren't handled as well as they could be, it, it shows that, you know, implicitly trusting any individual piece of data, you know, about a vulnerability that's being reported, um, or even CVE data, you know, you have to be careful. Um, you know, as I said with the CVEs, not all this stuff got CVEs, so if you were only looking at CVE data, you wouldn't have a complete picture, picture of what happened with this vulnerability. Um, so it's hard to implicitly trust you know, any one piece of data. You have to be careful about that. Um, so what can actually help? What are the actions that uh, users, developers, um, and researchers can, can take to help clear this fog? Um, well, ultimately, what causes these situations to be so messy is that you know, the data doesn't line up. It can be hard to divide, decipher. Um, so what can, on the developer and sort of researcher side of things, what can they do to help make this data bit better? Um, something that we think is particularly important in vulnerability reporting is that both parties have clear vulnerability disclosure policies. That's maybe intuitive to most of you, maybe not. You'll maybe, you know, you'll probably know about sort of, you know, vulnerability disclosure policies that software vendors and software maintainers would have. You maybe wouldn't have thought necessarily so much about researchers having vulnerability disclosure policies um, that they're communicating as well. Um, but we think um, that that's quite important. And what I specifically mean by you know, establishing on both sides clear policies is things like establishing the routes for um, private and public communications, what you're gonna, what you intend to communicate privately with, with, a, with a maintainer and what you intend to be disclosed publicly um, at the end of the day. Um, expectations and what information will be communicated, so what details, analy analysis, uh, exploit, proof of concepts, um, that researchers will intend to pass on um, and what both sides intend to keep private or make public. Um, researchers pledging to verify uh, any proposed fixes that are made. Um, and setting dates for public disclosure. So the purpose of that being um, you're saying that you set a point um, where you believe it's best that users are aware that a security issue exists and can act accordingly before bad actors find out an issue exists and operate it on, uh, operate on it for themselves. So even if something has not necessarily been fixed in a timely fashion, you get it out there into the eye of users so they're able to um, act accordingly. So that's on, that's on the, uh, the uh, maintainer and sort of researcher side of things. On the user side of things, um, we think it's important to be aware uh, of the ways that this vulnerability data can be misaligned, um, which we've seen plenty of the reasons uh, through this vulnerability. Um, to sort of summarize the key ones, um, it's important to be aware that one vulnerability um, can be disclosed multiple times. Um, so if you have you know, a vulnerability that's um, not fixed properly several times, or even just disclosures that, that misalign, um, that can lead to multiple disclosures. Um, and not all security issues run through the CVE process. This is something we see not necessarily commonly, but more than you would expect to see. 
we, we believe there's kind of a, there's a bit of a sort of um, gray area where security researchers and maintainers don't necessarily know whose responsibility it is when a vulnerability has been discovered who it is who actually goes to, to get a CV, uh, CV assigned and, and published out there um, in the public domain. Um, and when there's sort of a gray area, it can then mean no one does it. And um, so things don't necessarily uh, get um, CVEs. Um, and whilst that last point, there's things to be aware of, is not necessarily um, an action item as such. I think the point really is to say, uh, if you're in a situation where there's something, so not necessarily you know software security, but if you're in a situation where there's something, something or some data that you can't implicitly trust, um, then let that help you sort of adopt a more defensive posture. And so, whatever processes you have, you know, to manage security risks in the software you use, whether it's CVE data, other vulnerability data, dependency tracking, whatever you you you, you have in your environments, um, if there's anything you think you do. Or don't do because you're assuming, well, I get that security data from somewhere or I'm observing a security data and the data looks good. It's probably fine. Um, then being more defensive in reaction to the fact that there's a chance that data is maybe not so good. It's, it's not so fine. Um, then that can only be a, a good thing. And that's me. And so, yeah, thank you very much for listening. And happy to take um, any questions, plenty of time for questions. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so the question is asking, yeah, so for larger enterprise organizations, you know, you know, the open source side of it, how it relates to them, you know, our understanding, you know, open source software, its usage is so prolific. Um, it's not just, you know, randomers using open source software, you know, it, uh, you know, all, all organizations of all sorts, sizes use open source software. And it is, yeah, it is unfortunately reality. Um, I think of, you know, it's a relevant XKCD comic, uh, for everything. We've seen one of them in, in one of the earlier presentations. And it's that one with like all these sort of, um, the sort of like bricks, the Jenga blocks. And there's like a tiny, you know, which is your software stack. And then there's a tiny little block, which is some random component. Maintained by one guy in Arkansas or something, um, and you know if that falls apart, then the whole thing the whole thing um, falls down. Um, so it, it it it's important it's important for everyone basically um, that you know um, that this needs to be tracked. Um, and and but unfortunately, sort of you know so many packages are used, and obviously the larger the organization gets, the more uh, packages are used. Um, if if the data like this is poor, then you know it's just it's it's not. You know, no enterprise uh, organization is going to be like, no problem, all our size severity vulnerabilities will just uh, manually go and look through all this data like I have and just double check what was good and what was bad. That's not sustainable. So, you know, the, the, you know, we, we, we do need to make sure that, you know, uh, this data is clear and sort of more lined up um, so that, um, so that you know, users, developers can have more trust in it. Yep. I don't have any specific figures for that. No, um, I can just say anecdotally that it, it, it does happen. It happens more than you think it would. Um, um, so yeah, um, so I don't have a specific figure, but there, there, there are several occasions where that happens, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. When usually, what most people do, if you have vulnerability, it's disclosed, try to be fixed. People think it's fixed, and then later on, someone discovers that it isn't. And usually, that gets a second CVE. So you essentially have two CVE records which are tied together. Um, and as long as everyone knows that they're tied together, then you know the, the picture is clear. Um, you know, and it's it's just it's not that much different to if it's a brand new vulnerability, it's disclosed, right? But unfortunately, there's cases where uh, that doesn't line up. So no, I don't have a, I don't have a specific figure, but um, um, a worrying number. <laughs> Talented, 
Absolutely, yeah. They, uh, there's enough. There's enough. There's enough unclear data to go around. So yeah, I'm not gonna. Yeah, I won't go as far to say you know, again. You know, uh, and it's 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 came up several times. If anyone attended uh, my colleague Ray's talk on mobile web app security, he made sort of the same point that you know, like this isn't to say like, oh, these developers, what are they doing? You know, oh, it's so hard. Like this is difficult. This is all difficult. And you know, and like I'm inviting myself. You know, I'm saying you know, well, we discovered this issue. That's hopefully the last bit in the timeline. Um, so definitely no one else is going to come along and find that oh, actually that fix as bad as what, you know, a new SERP will hide it, you know, um, so, so it, it's all very difficult. But yes, um, you know, the, the, there's a lot of unclear data out, out there um, that, yeah, yeah, you can inspect. Yep, the back there. No, it's, it's a good question. Yeah, so the question is, yeah, when you have these sort of, you know, multiple CVEs for the one issue um, and tying them together, whose responsibility for that is? And I think the answer to that is basically the same one for the signing the CVEs in the first place. Um, it's not always very clear. Um, you know, you know, anyone, this is the thing, anyone is able to request a CVE. Um, and we see it often, like sometimes people who aren't involved in any way with the disclosure of vulnerability come along a layer point and say, oh, that should get a CVE and they go assign it. Um, so, so it, it can be anybody's responsibility, but unfortunately, when it becomes anybody's responsibility, then, you know, if no one actually steps forward because they think someone else is going to do it, then, then it doesn't happen. In terms of how they can be related together, you know, at the CVE level, like when CVE records get published by MITRE and then analyzed by MVD, National Vulnerability Database, um, you, you, there's no special way in that they're related. It would just be, it would be incumbent on whoever was disclosing the CVE to say this is related to this prior issue due to an incomplete fix. And there'll be plenty of CVE records where you'll see this exists due to an incomplete fix of earlier CVE. Um, so it's incumbent on whoever discloses the CVE. Yeah, unfortunately, that's, it's not always very clear um, who should do that, um, which is why if, but if you have, you know, if researchers and vendors have clear disclosure policies, then as long as someone, so if you're someone who's like a discovery vulnerability, want to contact the vendor, make them aware of it, if you have clear policies, then as long as someone establishes, I'm, um, I'll be the one to do CVE. Then, yeah, that you know, that it can be incumbent on them to sort of do, do the research and establish is this related to prior disclosures and make sure that data is clear. Hello, that's us. Thanks again. Thank you very much.